Hello. Welcome to the beginning of a journey. A journey that takes us to places that we never knew we could get to. Got on my special edition holographic lifted research group hat. That's a key word here, folks. Emphasize lifted because we're about to lift off. On April 30th, NASA Social tweeted out, it is the last day to apply to come behind the scenes of our next cargo launch to the space station. We want you to witness and share the experience from NASA Wallops in Virginia on May 19th to the 20th. Application and details are right here. So I clicked on that, came over here, read all of this, clicked on the supply now. It is now closed because the deadline has already passed, folks. Got an email that said, thank you for applying. Unfortunately, you were not selected. So I went off in the corner and cried, but not before I had read that they had placed my name on a waiting list. So while I was waiting in the corner crying, I got another email that said, congratulations. And I had to do one of these because I was raising the roof because we're about to go off in space. So the roof cannot contain us. We're reaching new heights here, people. But what is height? Because when we're off in space, where are we gauging the measurement from, right? So I was pretty excited to say the least. We are pleased to let you know that a spot has opened up and your application has been approved to attend the event. So now, nothing else was holding me back except for packing. I gotta make some money to buy a ticket to Virginia. Let's get to it.
exhausted from the work of the day, I collapse against the trunk of a tree, shaded from the heat of the sun. The cool grass washing away the scorched feeling upon me, as if I am the thing producing the high temperatures, wedged into a position that at most times will be an uncomfortable one, hard and exposed to the earth. But like molten steel, I was poured here, filling each crack and crevice, now finding solace against the rough bark of a plant, listening to the world move around me like a dark cavernous pool, the chirps of birds echoing throughout, rolling the back of my skull on a knot like getting a massage. Opening my eyes, I can see just how slow I have become as clouds are given time to witness movement across the sky, flowing over me like the water in the ditch nearby, smoothing out my experience as if I were a polished rock. Do I ever really move? Looking at it all now, it's as if everything has always merely been moving around me. Earth pushing up to bend the knee, wind sweeping me from here to there, the inertia of being dropped into a vast cosmic pool upon birth. Really, I don't think I've ever moved, but everything else moving gives me the appearance of doing so. So I kind of like doing this little bit of wordplay, as it were, as of late, where instead of looking at how the mind has been conditioned to recognize certain statements and words, I like to look at the shadow of words. For example, let's look at the statement, nobody got anywhere without believing in themselves. So. In general, when we hear the statement or read this statement, we think nobody as a generalized sense of everybody in that everybody who didn't believe in themselves got nowhere and nowhere is a sense of success, meaning that they were unsuccessful because they didn't believe in themselves. However, if we look at the reverse of this statement and we think of nobody as an actual individual, and nobody as a manifestation of an ideal, and we give characteristics to this thing, nobody. Nobody itself is a living thing. It's kind of like a being. And nobody got anywhere, meaning that nobody was able to get everywhere that didn't believe in itself. Anyways, just remember to look at the flip side of things and uh, you know sometimes it can make you a little bit dizzy looking at the world upside down but it's kind of still the same world you know what I mean just kind of a fun uh, little exercise to participate in dude what's up there you guys want to see what's up there I know what's up there we just got a bath. Let's check it out. All right, up here. Okay. So I don't want to be too much of a disturbance here.
So the nice thing about being at the dump is you can throw things right out and don't have to have any sort of guilt whatsoever. Cut. Yeah, just so simple. Matter of cutting some rope. Yeah, we're going to the dump in style, dude. Here we go. King Wu Fu Chai, of Wu, son of Master Sun's patron, He Lu, once said, Wild beasts, when at bay, will fight desperately. How much more true is this of men? This is the art of war.
The next stop is for B Gates. B as in Bravo.
just arrived in Alexandria trying out this app called Airbnb kind of part of the whole app revolution thing where you know everyone's got their own side hustle going everyone's an uber and now you got an extra room you put it up on Airbnb well uh, this is Virginia for you This is my first time being in Virginia. I've been to the East Coast a couple times, mostly just New York, but you know, that's like Manhattan, which definitely does not represent where I'm at currently. This is green, this is lush, you know, it's humid, it's moist, it's warm right now, even though it looks like, you know, it's about to downpour on me at the moment, but it's nice though. It's easy on the eyes, you know what I mean? Like, uh, back home, Desertville, you need sunglasses, otherwise uh, your eyes turn to mush and melt out your sockets. So this is nice. Looking forward to this. Almost feels like you're in the jungles a little bit, you know? But definitely the trees are a little bit different here. I mean, you don't have to go down too much further and you're in Florida and that's tropical, so. Colombian sweet coffee. The bitter flavor, welcomed only by a harsh palate. The sweet sights of childhood innocence, thrown out with the euphemisms of a dark world. Maturity breeds an exploration into stimulation. Colombia's cocaine is really a bean, exported by the ton to provide motivation where it's not found. An unpleasant flavor becomes pleasant with the feeling it provides. Tales tell that not everything has to be bittersweet. El Dorado whispered, wanted, without work. La Puerta de Oro de la Amazonia siempre pies ausencia. Sueños solo nacidos de café dulce de Colombia. Thanks for the wonderful conversation and the cozy bed. Best wishes, Austin. So made it to the Alexandria waterfront and uh, water's about to breach the front. Coming right up over the barrier here. It's nice out actually. I mean, it seems like it should be really cold. Maybe it's just because I'm acclimatized to a little bit of a different, kind of more inhospitable environment. So this feels good to me. Um, but yeah, let's take a quick tour of the waterfront here.
shit. Stay in the left two lanes. All right, everybody, so here is my second point of interest so far while being in Virginia. I'm gonna do a little tour around the place. So we just left the room that I'm staying in. Gotta make sure that that's closed because things will get in there as you will soon see. There is plenty of life here. All right, let's continue onward. Seems uh, like a very old home that's been here for quite a while. Now you're gonna see here the three and a half year olds, I guess. And the male right now is being very territorial because the female, I guess, is in heat. There's some peacocks running around here and some horses and chickens. And all manner of things. So if you are comfortable with living in close proximity to other living things, then this is the place for you. Now, for me, it's not that big of a problem because I grew up on a farm where such things are going on as well. So it's really pretty comparable to kind of a lot of places that I am comfortable at. So got some surfboards going on there. And it is super wet. The launch actually got pushed back. We got some geese. That looks flooded for sure. But yeah, there you go. I think I got a good shot of the peacocks. I first arrived. They are nowhere to be found at the moment. But I'm 
sure they're around somewhere. Gated residence to keep everything from being where it's not supposed to be, I guess, which within the gate is pretty much anywhere. The lady is super friendly. And honestly, this whole Airbnb thing has been quite the experience. It's uh, a little more humbling than like staying in hotels or resorts or things to that extent because you're actually with the people that live in the areas and the places. And you get a real sense for what life here is kind of like. I mean, wherever you go, and I've traveled quite a bit, you know, things really are quite similar, but you know, it's just those distinguishing factors between different dishes that give things a different flavor. And by really kind of, I guess, living amongst the people that are at the places that you're visiting, you're able to much more, I guess, gain a sense of those distinguishing factors between different places because you know you get to see how the people here really are because a lot of people put on a front a facade when they're working in a corporate or business um, type of environment or setting and so kind of pulling back the whole charade you know lifting the veil from what you see from the business perspective allows you to gain a greater sense of appreci uh, appreciation greater sense of appreciation for being where you're at. So I'm gonna go scope out the flight facility. I'm gonna go possibly buy a few amenities. I didn't check any bags, so pretty much had to get rid of a lot of that stuff and I'm gonna go and gather up some of it now. But I see a horse over here. She said that she just had a colt and she is hopefully going to raise a prize winning horse that she is going to present to the Kentucky Derby. It smells like a barn. Everything's quite wet, quite soggy. It's like a marshland. But uh, if you've been kind of watching my journey for me to actually make enough to come out here, I was able to connect with this woman quite a bit because she was talking about how her chickens weren't, you know, laying eggs and all this other stuff. And I was like, well, back at our house, we just had to deal with the problem of some of our chickens eating the eggs. She thought that there was some sort of predatory animal sneaking into the coop and eating. She's like, maybe I'll have to check that out. Sometimes they do stuff like that. And you know, she's like, I need to go clean out the chicken coop. I was just sitting here thinking like, oh man, I should probably offer to like clean out the chicken coop for her. But she was like, it's been a year. And I was like thinking, oh man, I know how bad it gets after a couple of months. And with it being like swampland down here, like right on the coast, like the ocean is literally just like a hop, skip and a jump, like through the trees and across a field, you know what I mean? It's right there. It's like with the tide rising up and coming over the shoreline and then all of a sudden this huge downpour coming in, I was just like, that's gotta be some serious chicken coopage. And uh, I did my chicken coopage time to get here, but we'll see how things all play out. Maybe I'll be a good Samaritan. Hunting here would definitely be a chore. Let's uh, see which of you hunters out there can spot where the animal's at. I'll give you another three seconds. Three, two, one. There you go. It's gone. I am between south and the north here. 
conflict where I'm from really doesn't seem like part of my history or past at all. But for a lot of people here, it most definitely is. It's like when I went to Quebec and there's still people like fighting over speaking French or English, literally people handing pamphlets out in the street saying don't speak English and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of those types of conflicts kind of reverberate through generations. And you can feel the reverberation here, for sure. Well, there she blows. That's my first good look at it. It's like the largest open space that I've seen so far here in VA. Looks like that's Orbital Command. I don't know. Some sort of telecommunication satellite system. Big old dishes. A raid to do something uh, spectacular, I'd suppose. Who knows? Maybe it's all for shows. Goddard Space Flight Center, I'm guessing that's what that L-I-G-H is supposed to say. Goddard, it makes me uh, think about Jimmy Neutron over here or something. I wonder if that's where they got the name for the dog from, is this. You good boy? Or uh, the Wallops flight facility. The world may never know, but that's why we're conducting missions like this, everybody. Those satellites bounce off of stars, which are really just a little bit of information. And hopefully, as we pinpoint the location of stars, and the stream of data that they're spewing out at light speed, we can figure out truly what all of this means. Well, I'm here. Not much to see at the moment. to be out here in Virginia, I don't know. But it is, and that's why we're here. We're over now to a place called Chincoteague Island. Now, the East Coast coastline is vastly different than the West Coast coastline that I'm more familiar with. There's like all these little sparse kind of outcroppings, little jetties, deltas, what have you. And it's like this sporadic entanglement of tiny little islands and, you know, like bridges connecting everything and just all that type of stuff like these little fingers kind of going out all over into the ocean and 
you, all these things are like interconnected but each of them have their own little communities and like wharfs and docking stations and all this stuff it's too much I feel like you know to try and figure out during this one trip this is like something that you know somebody could spend their whole life kind of living here and exploring all these little offshoots traveling you know across built up little vehicle fords connecting everything and uh each of them seems to be like a lively kind of individual community all its own so yeah just a, a very different place than what i'm i'm used to but it's very neat and I like the whole, you know, salty air uh, feel. Like, I'm very familiar with how it feels, you know, on the Washington coast. And I need to clarify, not Washington, D.C., because that's right over here. I'm talking about the state and, you know, the Oregon coastline and uh, California especially. It's way different than all of this. But, you know, you still have kind of like that salty air type of thing going on here where it's like fresh, caught food all over the place, you know, come and get your crab and whatever else that was just caught locally here, you know, while it's raining outside and soak it up with some butter, you know, that type of feeling. That's what I'm talking about. How's that? Uh, I was talking to somebody and they said that it requires a pass it's like a national park to go to the beach here but if I buy like a week pass then I'm good all week and maybe I'll go and check that out I really like and enjoy kind of walking around the beach and checking out tide pools and stuff like that if there are any I'm not sure what the coastline is exactly like here if it's sandy or rocky or you know, a reef that kind of resides, or, uh, what's the word? Recedes as the tide comes in, I don't know. I'm sure there's all of that, I mean, it just kind of depends exactly where you are on the coastline, you know what I mean? So, yeah. taco shop on an island out near the ocean. I'm sure you'd like to try one of their fish tacos, but since you can't, I will try one for you and I'll let you know how good it is. Love you guys. Coming into Ocean City, Maryland. nightlife here. I was recommended to come here by my host. Supposedly there is a 40th year anniversary to some bar called the Bearded Clam. And then also there's, you know, just a vivacious nightlife and streets full of different social clubs. So we're gonna check it out. And there we go. Lovely day at the beach, yo. One of the diehards are here, man. I think I see someone out there windsurfing. Their face. Well, I'm here 
as well, y'all. It's kind of beached well, boys. was a little more uh, anti-climactic than I thought it was going to be. Get it? So uh, ended up going and talking to really the only two people there that were somewhat near my age, Dylan and Jane. They are a part of the family that has been running that shop since it opened up. Their grandfather opened it up. He named it the Bearded Clam. And I was like talking to him. And I was like, yeah, when I looked up the Bearded Clam on Google, I didn't get like a bar as like my first hit. You know what I mean? And she's like, yeah, it's a vagina joke. And I was like, oh, so your grandfather was like a salty sailor, you know? And they're like, uh, yeah, pretty much. So. place is just a scene you know what I mean it'd be pretty cool to see what it's like uh, you know when it's all sunny and whatever but this is a thing all its own you know what I mean it's like like I said it's just the, like the ocean spray like it's got a vibe right now that's really reminiscent of that. She said that the horses wouldn't come out until the sun went down. I mean, in my opinion, it was like the sun wasn't even up. But here they are. Any of y'all ever been on that, like, Pirates of the Caribbean ride in Disneyland? It almost kind of feels like that here. It's like a grim fairy tale. You know what I mean? Alright, so it's time for the night excursion, folks. Check out this place, you're gonna I think it's pretty dope. Especially in the dark. Actually you're not gonna know what to think. Really. Dragon faucet. I feel like I'm walking into like an alchemy shop. Just like some. Got all the signs up here. Bird signs, family portraits, lots of necklaces going on. 
get into the cool stuff. Got an old clock. Just some hats, I mean, nothing big, you know. Got some canes, and then all of a sudden the house just becomes like this historical thing when you step into a few of these other rooms. It's just like, whoa. You know? They're all peacock feathers, dude. got the music playing in the background you know gives it just that nice extra bit of vibage here I think there's some parrot feathers too right here dude It's just like, who is this person? You know what I mean? It's like, that's what I'm thinking. It's just like, I want to get to know the history of all this stuff. You know what I mean? It's like... Freaking Amazon, dude. It just like sets the mood of like where I'm at, you know what I mean? It's like it's almost like swampy, bayou territory is what it kind of seems like. It's not. People here don't have an accent like that or anything. I'm more like upper east coast, you know? But still, it almost is like trickling that vibe a little bit here to me. this dude. Yeah. And then of course we have going in here dude. Tams, Adriftas, Catalinas, Embers, and all kinds of good beach music bands. So don't forget, Saturday night, Carolina Beach Music Staff will be on WBSR. Maybe you'll get it right this time. It's the return of beach music with Billy and Tim right here on This is where we're at, everybody. In Virginia, dudes. Tomorrow, I'm going to go see a freaking NASA launch, boys. It's pretty dark here. All right. So I just opened up this door in my room. You know, nothing too serious going on here. We just got some sex in this city. Some uh, crossroads, you know, VHS. I know that's a little abnormal, especially for the up and coming generation, but then, pow, dude. You see that? Look up. That's because there is an up, there is a place to go up there. And we didn't come here to go nowhere. No. Like I said, we came here to find. A dead bird and also to climb 
to new heights that no one has ever gone to before. All right, we're looking up, dude. We're gonna find something freaky up here, dudes. Like a vampire is gonna freaking come out, dude. And I'm, I'm telling you guys, I know it. Like this place just sucks in people that come and stay here, dude. And then at night they get put up in this room, and what's ever living up in there, I'm telling you, comes out at night and gets who's ever staying here. Alright, let's go to sleep. Ugh. Fuck this shit just in case you guys tonight. Oh, craziest doorknobs ever, right? I sure do want to go to that. NASA launch, but my video might do better if something comes and attacks me in the night and somebody discovers my video log. So we'll just leave it open. Off the coast, sunken ships of a bygone era, once casting great shadows. Now full of lost treasure and wet wood, skeletons are quick to come to life in the light of imagination. Just picturing the craft is enough to invoke the feeling of a dream. Massed like grand feathers of a bird swimming through the sky, ardent in color like it was style that caught the wind. Coming into land at a place reflecting the vibrant nature of life within the reef. Looking up now at the sky, as if it were only the surface to whatever ocean I am now in. Well, I made it. I'm here at the NASA Wallops Flight Facility Visitor Center. It's the first day orientation, as it were. I don't really know what to expect at all haven't even heard anything really because I have no one to talk to about the event. Everything's just been speculation up to this point. I grew up next to a very prominent military base, Hill Air Force Base. Um, so I'm kind of expecting something, you know, similar to that. And I have been on that base multiple times. But other than that, I'm expecting like a hybrid, a museum. Also, there's a Hill Aerospace Museum that's a very intriguing place to go to where I grew up as well. So I'm kind of thinking that it's going to be very similar to that, but I don't really have much to go on other than those two things. So you'll be kind of joining me on this ride of a new experience, as it were. So buckle in because we're about to set sail. This is the entrance to the facility here. You can see the satellites in the background. Across the road is the military installation. Now, I do live in Logan currently and I know that Utah State University, if I'm not mistaken, is actually like on the forefront of 
education in regards to rocket science, surprisingly enough, but not too surprising because Dugway Proving Grounds and all those testing areas are right down in the southern portion of the state, so let's take a look inside. if you're going to need it and make sure that all of your electronic devices are charged. Um, we may not have that many opportunities to charge throughout the day. We do have a bit of a break where you can, but when we're going in and out of all the buildings, there may not be all of the outlets available, so just make sure we're good there. We're going to be going all over wallops from the launch pad, the balloon laboratory, sounding rockets, and we may even see some surprise guests along the way that were not listed on your schedule, so that'll be fun. Um, another reminder that I have for the tour is all of our guest speakers and NASA, Orville, ATK, everybody involved, they understand that you're all like really social media savvy. So I want you guys to know that like this is your tour. So I want you to be respectful of the presentations, of course, and I'll listen to the whole thing. But if there's time, I don't want you guys to be shy, be like, can I pick this up and take a picture with it? Absolutely go ahead if they allow you to. Just don't be shy to ask. They're there to help you best deliver your message to your audience in any way that they can. Science, um, we can do that in, in, in very low cost uh, means by a scientific balloon, which otherwise would have to go into space on a rocket on a satellite, which is very, very expensive to do sometimes. Um, we have a, our own little Air Force here. I was in the Air Force at one point, so I, it's, I call it the Air Force. We have all Navy pilots, interestingly enough, but anyway, it's still the Air Force. But, but we fly half of the agency's science hours, science missions, and so our, what we can do with our aircraft, um, they're all highly configurable. Uh, our engineers like to cut all kinds of holes in them, mount instruments, and our, our pilots, all of them have been test pilots at one point for the United States Navy. They go fly them and make sure that uh, the plane can still fly, and then we go off to our wide uh, locations. Um, to do the science we need to do. And so with all of our platforms, whether it's aircraft, sounding rockets, or balloons, we go to where the science is, right? And that's what we deliver for the agency here. We're highly mobile, we go to where the science is, and, and uh, our different portfolios, where it's, whether it's an aircraft up to 30, 35,000 feet, a balloon up to 160,000 feet, or a sounding rocket up to 1,000 miles, right? There's a lot of altitudes that we can reach with our suborbital platforms to be able to, to collect that science. We do work with, uh, with NOAA satellite data. Uh, I guess my my favorite um, space thing is, is a movie, The Martian, Mark Watney, the space pirate. Um, and I like that movie particularly because my uh, my nine year old daughter loves that, and we watch it together several times. So that's my, that's my space. Hi, I'm Dana Bogdanoff. I do marketing for an engineering company. Um, I'm also an engineer. Um, so I think my favorite thing in space is probably the. GPS satellite and GLONASS satellite, satellite network. As an engineer, I think the communication system and the network system is all pretty cool. Hi, uh, my name is also Chelsea. Um, <laughs> hey! Um, I'm a science writer with space.com, and my favorite planet is Venus. 
And fun fact, I'm in a touring indie rock band. <laughs> it's, it's called Foxanne, self-promo, self-promo. <laughs> Hi guys, um, I'm PB. Pumpkinberry is my handle. I play video games on the internet, mostly space ones. Um, and my favorite thing in space is actually the Korean Nebula I have tattooed on my back. Hi guys, I'm uh, Charlie Gervais. It's really an honor to be here with you guys. Um, I'm an inter intermediate mathematician. I've just gotten into convolutional neural networks with GPS data. Um, really, a fun fact about me I'm a hockey player and I've uh, played in Asian. Elite men's league tournaments. So, go to go hockey. I'm Mike Bang. Um, I'm a founding uh, uh, partner at a company called Data Machines, and we actually do a lot of research at the Defense Advanced Research Product Agency, which is the military's research sort of agency. Um, I came out of a cyber warfare and cyber security research role, um, and uh, I guess my favorite space object is the ISS. I think it's enabled an extremely uh, diverse set of scientific innovation and more opportunity to explore and understanding of the universe around us. I just feel that back. Yeah. My favorite space thing is a comet we landed on. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Rucker. I'm a senior studying electrical engineering at Texas Tech University. I just finished a four-month internship at NASA Kennedy. So I'm looking forward to seeing another rocket launch. They are still fun. And my favorite space thing is the Earth and all its round, spherical, <laughs> and non-flat glory. And if they were still in space, they would be my favorite thing. Nice. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Mo Dietrich. I'm a fifth grade teacher in St. Mary's County. Um, my favorite thing is Walt Simon because I uh, go out when they launch and I'm trying to get my whole family out and say, darn, they screw. And um, I guess my favorite thing about space is all these black holes. Hi, I am Dan. Uh, I run Page uh, Science Enthusiast on Facebook, scienceenthusiast.com, on Instagram, Twitter, everything like that. Uh, my favorite thing would be the Apollo program because, I mean, duh. So. <laughs> hey folks, I'm Josh. I help run social media for the National Academies of uh, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, favorite thing about space is uh, meteor showers. I don't think I've ever seen anything so incredible as that. Um, and fun fact, uh, my uncle helped work on the insulation for space shuttles, like the black panel and bomb. Like facility in Virginia, I'm Claire Skelly from NASA's Office of Communications. Today we're going to talk about several of the research investigations heading to the International Space Station on the next Cargo Resupply Services mission. Orbital ATK's Cygnus spacecraft is packed and will launch a Terry's rocket no earlier than 4.39 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday morning. Like I said, we have a lot of great information to share with you about what's on board, and we will have time for your questions as I bring each of the speakers up. For anyone listening on the phone, you can press star one to be entered into the queue. And if you're following along online, just use the hashtag AskNASA. Our first two speakers we're gonna bring up are Kurt Costello from the International Space Station Program Office, the Chief Scientist, and Liz Warren from the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, also known as CASIS, the organization that manages the National Lab. everybody who made the trip out today. Uh, I just wanted to start off by saying we're really excited about the Orbital ATK-9 launch. The Cygnus is bringing with it over 3,000 kilograms of cargo to the International Space Station. Over 1,000 of those kilograms are on board to support the 50 science and technology demonstration experiments that we have and two new facilities flying the ISS. Today we're going to be hearing about at least four of those different areas of science and technology demonstration going on board. And uh, they ranged from uh, doing atomic physics and quantum mechanics studies to studying some of the distant galaxies <coughs> and X-ray emissions from those galaxies. The uh, presenters today are going to be covering topics uh, 
from the Cold Atom Laboratory, uh, the coldest man-made spot in the universe, and they'll be on to talk about some of those atomic physics and quantum physics um, topics. The uh, second presenters are going to be uh, talking about using surface tension to separate immiscible fluids in zero G, something that hasn't been tried before. Uh, we'll hear from folks who are doing uh, the mixing and solidification of cement on orbit, and we'll see what that has uh, happened to it when it's done in zero G. And finally, we'll be hearing about a trio of Earth observing satellites, CubeSats, that are going to be deployed from uh, the NanoRax CubeSat deployer and the Gemini rocket. But first, I'll hand it over to my colleague from the National Lab and CASES, who will talk more about those experiments. Thanks, Kurt. Um, so, as Kurt said, we're super excited to be here. It's really pretty out here at Wallops, and uh, it's super exciting <coughs> to see a rocket launch. I want to remind you guys that when that launch goes, and you're saying, you know, go Antares, go Cygnus, say go science, too. <laughs> um, you're going to hear from scientists today who have spent uh, a lot of time, a lot of energy, blood, sweat, and tears getting their payloads ready for the spacecraft and to go to space. And uh, it, they're really, really excited to you. They're going to tell you all about their research. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the ISS National Lab. First of all, the space station is an absolutely incredible place to do research. And these scientists that are sending their research to the space station uh, are super anxious to take advantage of some of the unique aspects of space flight, and that includes microgravity, it includes a vantage point with which to study the Earth, and also, not necessarily the case for, this, uh, ex for these experiments, but putting uh, experiments outside the space station to take advantage of a really, really harsh, extreme environment. So uh, NASA and the ISS National Lab work together uh, to basically open the door to researchers uh, all over the world, in NASA's case, and then for the ISS National Lab, all over the United States, to put research on the space station. And uh, CASIS, the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, with which whom I represent, we are privileged to be able to work with NASA in this capacity and provide access to the, re to the research community that includes academia uh, and student experiments. I believe we have over 20 student experiments launching. Um, it includes industry, and so you'll hear from Zyphoid Industries, as Kurt mentioned, the, uh, the continuous fluid flow uh, separation experiment, and then also other, other government agencies, such as the NIH and NSF. So again, we're super happy to be here. We'll be able to answer your questions later, and uh, I'll hand it back to Kurt um, to introduce our first science team. Thank you, Liz. So first up, I'd like to introduce the Cold Atom Lab team. Um, they're here today to talk about this new, unique facility on board the ISS and the amazing science that it's going to allow us to do for the first time. Uh, CAL, or the Cold Atom Laboratory, has been uh, in development for the last five years, and I'll be handing the mic over to Dr. Kamal Odiri uh, from JPL and Dr. Eric Cornell from NIST. Dr. Cornell received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001 for his co-discovery or uh, co-synthesis of the first BBC Bose-Einstein condensate samples in, uh, in the world. So thank you, uh, and here's the count. Less than one nanokelvin. So we've had to get within 
one billionth of a degree of absolute zero. And I'm going to start right off by saying why, because why would you ever want to get that cold? And the answer has to do with, with really looking, if you look at the future, if you look at the trajectory of technology, of economics, uh, of the technology that drives the modern economy, it's easy to understand that the future is in the direction of the very, very small. Small transistors, small computers, uh, small nanobots. And at these very small scales, the physics, the science, the underlying thing that matters is called quantum physics or quantum mechanics. If you want to be able to design the technology that's going to underpin the economy of tomorrow, you not to have to, you have to understand quantum mechanics not just at the level of that junior level class you took in college. You've got to really get it. You've got to grok it. You've got to feel it in your bones. You'd really like to be able, basically, to see the stuff. And it's true that quantum mechanics is the, is the science of the very, very small. But due to sort of a twist of fate, it's also the science of the extraordinarily cold. Getting extraordinarily cold has the effect of magnifying quantum mechanics, up to the effect where you can see it. So you can actually see what amounts to waves of quantum matter a millimeter or two millimeters across. These things are called Bose-Einstein condensates. This idea, this sort of relevance, this connection between the very, very cold and the science which underpins the very small, which underpins the future of, of, the, of our economy, is not a new idea. In fact, there are hundreds of groups around the world here on Earth, including mine, which are studying this thing called Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, with this idea in mind. But up in space, we hope to be able to get colder yet. Um, and how do we get this cold? Here on Earth, we use lasers, uh, which seems counterintuitive. Why would lasers make things cold? But they do, and then magnets to hold the atoms together and eventually let the hot ones pour out. And that's about, and we'll use all that same technology up in space. But in space, we can go one step uh, further. And this final step is, in some sense, a step backwards to your uh, high school chemistry class, where you may have learned that if you take a gas and you let a gas expand, like you put it in a cylinder and you gradually expand the cylinder, the gas inside cools down. It's the ideal gas law. And so you might think, well, why don't we just do this on Earth? We hold the atoms in a little magnetic box here on Earth, and we try to open up the box. But here, under the influence of gravity on Earth, you open up the box and the atoms pour out. Up in space, effectively weightless, microgravity, we can continue to open up the box, actually turn it off, and let the atoms expand gradually, just hang there, to the point to where we get, get the temperatures and durations of the experiment, which really aren't accessible here on Earth. We, get, we hope to get to a point well under a nano Kelvin, and we hope to be able to see condensates and then later do experiments in these things over clouds which might be one or two millimeters across. Something you could really, you know, we actually use microscopes and magnifying glasses and cameras to look at it, but in principle you could see with your bare eye. And therefore, you get that kind of underlying intuition, which you think will be useful for uh, science and technology in the future. And my colleague, Kamal, you want to? OK, thank you, Eric. As uh, Kurt said, for being the first human team to achieve more Einstein condensate uh, you know, on Earth, and now we're very excited that we are providing you um, an opportunity to even go cooler um, in, in, on ISS. So what uh, Eric is holding is, this is the heart of the instrument. It's, it's a physics fact. This is where um, actually we do all the, uh, we pull the atoms. And as uh, Eric mentioned, we apply lasers and, and precise uh, magnetic fields. Uh, and as the atoms are cooled, when they reach maximum uh, lower temperatures, Actually, we turn off the lasers and the magnetic uh, field, and we allow gently for for this cloud of atoms to just uh, expand. And this is this is the precise moment when uh, Eric and other principal investigators start the uh, science. Uh, we're very excited because, like, the, can you, if you go back to the first uh, photo, uh, so called Atom Lab is a this is still it's a multi-use. Um, user facility, it fits in about five lockers in the express uh, locker, and it will be installed by the, the two astronauts that we have, uh, uh, Drew and Scott, so we've been working closely with them, and they're looking forward to, it will take um, you know, about a shift maximum to install it, and then we will be able to power up the instrument and start what we call commissioning phase to ensure that, uh, you know, 
it will solve the science and within three months we hope to start returning the science. Uh, what's really important here, in addition to what Eric mentioned about quantum physics, the Cole Atom Laboratory also will give us some or, or better understanding as we use these um, cooled atoms to understand gravity. And we have a few uh, principal investigators that we can specialize in that. And just I want to note some of the challenges it was to uh, miniaturize some of the key components, and one of them is with this uh, it's called Quanto, which is a spin off from Colorado Boulder University. Yeah, Boulder. We, we should mention that. Um, these, when these experiments are done on Earth, they're done in a typical university-sized laboratory, maybe a thousand square feet. They're constantly tended to by three or four specialized scientists who sort of wait on them hand and foot. Uh, that's not available. The astronauts are busy, and space is at a premium, and it's especially weight is at a premium out there, and power consumption. So the, the challenge was to miniaturize all of this technology, which imagine filling up you know, the size of a fairly large room into something which would fit in that box we saw up there, draw a reasonable amount of power, and then in order for us to take advantage of it, there will be cameras staring in at this, cameras staring in at the, at the place where the atoms at their very coldest, taking pictures of the atoms, recording everything that happens, beaming it down to the various different groups of scientists uh, and engineers who are working on it here on Earth. That's correct, and most importantly, we have to automate the process because it will be operated remotely when in these laboratories you realize about uh, on a team of multiple uh, you know scientists in real time and just lastly I would it took like a, a multiple center NASA centers to make this possible so it was designed built uh, and delivered by the Jeff Walsh laboratory uh, uh, we have uh, science uh, slips and at headquarters and ISS that have sponsored it and championed the idea. And of course, we'll work closely with Marshall uh, Space uh, Flight Center uh, during the operation. So as you can see, it took a lot of uh, work and also collaborating with universities to make this happen. And we're really, really excited to give Eric and, and other principal investigators the, the ideal instrument we hope to reach cold with them. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you both. Now we'll open it up for some questions. Again, if you're listening over the phone, press star one to be entered into the queue. And if you're watching on social media, use the hashtag AskNASA. Let's start in the room. Please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to come to you. So my question, my question is, what are your hopefuls in regards to utilizing the technology for quantum computing and then superconductors because I, I know that both of those devices utilize very, very cold temperatures and the colder you get, the better they perform. So it's, it's true that actually one of the applications of Bose-Einstein condensation, which is not itself a quantum computer, it's like the working fluid, the freon that surrounds some quantum computers. This particular experiment doesn't aim directly at that. But it is an experiment that we'll look at, um, I didn't talk so much about, but the interaction between three or four atoms interacting in a quantum mechanical way. So we're really studying quantum mechanical wave functions with 10, 11, 12 degrees of freedom. And 12 should sound to you like a bite and a half. <laughs> so that's kind of the direction we're going, trying to let, reach towards the, the increased level of complexity that's associated with the hundreds and hundreds of bits you'd want to have uh, quantum, quantum information in, in a quantum computer, but gradually. In this case, not quite that far. Do we have another question in the room? Right here, second row. Um, my question is, oh. <laughs> because of your specific, unbelievable history working with Bose-Einstein condensates, how excited are you to get this instrument in microgravity? Extremely excited. Extremely excited. It's, it's been a very long time coming, and uh, I'm an impatient person. <laughs> so yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. We'll be uh, uh, probably like you know, remember when you saw the Martian, like at JPL, they had like sort of a little mini version of the rover and things like that. That they have a little mini version of this at JPL. We hope even as soon as uh, maybe next month be going and trying out some of our ideas in gravity, which is not as good as in space, but like sort of getting ready for when the thing is fully commissioned and we can get our virtual hands on it, <laughs> uh, which will probably, I think might need to be sometime this fall. Okay. Right here, second row. So I 
understand that there are a few Nobel Prize winners at NIST. I think the last I heard count of was four. Is getting an experiment flown on the ISS something that you can read the other Nobel Prize winners about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you probably don't know this, but the Nobel laureates go out, how do they have drinking nights on Friday? <laughs> you know, we talk about our golf games, and uh, this is going to be giving me bragging rights. I think everyone else should be buying drinks. <laughs> Hi, say manspace.com. Uh, what's the duration of the mission? How long will it last? And what kind of resolution can you get on your imaging? So the so the whole Adam lab is expected to last three years um, from the start of the science. So that's what also some of the complexity that we have to deal with and the challenges because this is the first ever instrument that does this kind of science that is expected to last that long. In terms of the resolution, maybe um, since, since basically the science on, on the cold atom lab is we take high resolution images. I, I, I think it's, it's, roughly speaking, it's about uh, six microns to the pixel, but there's going to be a higher, there, there were, there's talk of an upgrade, which we're, we're working on now, or they're working on at JPL, which will have finer resolution, so you can see sort of a finer grain. But already at the existing uh, resolution, because these waves have gotten so large, it's plenty fine enough for us to see the detail we need to see. Thank you. I guess we'll take one more question in the room. How dependent, how dependent upon you are, for, um, on the, is this experiment on consumables? Are you expecting to have to ship helium or something else up there? To, no, nope, it's all self-contained. It's, it's funny when, when uh, people visit my, my Earth-based laboratory to see, you know, world's record low temperatures and what have you, they expect to see bubbling fumes of cryogens, nitrogen and helium and everything. This particular technology, the only thing that's going to be cold is the atoms themselves. The glass, half a centimeter away, will be at room temperature, or as we like to call it, 300 Kelvin. So uh, it's not actually surrounded by baths of liquid nitrogen, liquid helium. It's a different sort of technology. It consumes power, and when it's uh, even when it's asleep, it uses 100 watts, and when it's fired up, it uses six, seven hundred watts. But um, you know, they, they, you see those big sails on the ISS. That's what they're there for. And uh, it, uh, there's other re other ISS resources that it, it draws on. For instance, RF downlink, so we can talk yeah. back and forth. That there's bandwidth that we need. But uh, besides, other than that, it's just electricity. And we hope not too much of the astronaut's time. If it works as it's supposed to, it's just a little green flashing light on their console. But, uh, otherwise, who knows? They might have to do a repair job. <laughs> Thank you guys so much, Kamal and Eric. Uh, we're looking forward to following the Cold Atom Laboratory in orbit. Thanks. <laughs>
So traditionally, people do this with gravity. So you have a settling tank, the heavy phase goes to the bottom, the light phase goes to the top. You just have to wait and settling of cars. And that's how it's been done from probably 100 years or uh, ever since organic chemistry exists. But if you go in a continuous paradigm, how are you going to, to take care of this separation? It would be nice to have different tools that have actually are designed uh, to operate in a continuous way. And so this is what uh, my company, company I co-founded, Zypho Flow Technologies is doing. And maybe the video uh, can, can show, uh, give you know, a sense of what we are doing and how. So if you see here, there's a device. You have a two-phase flow coming from the bottom left. You have water in red, and the clear liquid is uh, toluene in this case, an organic solvent. So it gets into the device and gets continually separated. So how do we do this? We leverage surface forces as opposed to gravity. So think of the nonstick pan you have at home. You know, it's a, a, a slab of teflon coating. When you pour oil, the oil will spread, and the water will be dark. So this has to do with charge, the charges of the liquids and the charge of the surface. If they like each other, then the oil, then the, the liquid will spread. And you say the liquid wets the surface. And if they don't like each other, it will be dark. And so that's exactly what we use inside. We have a terminal membrane, and we have accurate control of pressures and conditions inside, so you can leverage this principle for a, a continuous and selective separation that is actually scalable. So what you've seen in the device is a bigger brother of what's going to space. It will be used in pharmaceutical processing for so-called pilot plants, so when you make more material to test out. This is the device that we are sending to space. It's a smaller version. On Earth, would be used for uh, laboratory applications. So uh, on the bottom, there's a separating membrane. And here, there's some uh, pressure control that we do in order to use this principle in a viable way. So what are we going to explore in space, and, and why, I guess, is the next question. So what? Uh, we'll explore separation. So we will test the device in a, in a number of conditions different flow rates, uh, different scenarios, and we'll benchmark what is happening in space with what is happening on the Earth, and try to see if there's uh, something interesting that, that, that can be learned in order to improve this technology. So here we are doing essentially a fundamental paradigm shift in which people, in the way people have processed chemicals. So we're shifting from a gravity-based paradigm to a forced surface forces driven. And uh, the next question is why? So there's two main reasons. One is to benefit what we do on Earth, and the other one is to look forward to activities in space. So I'll give you an example. So uh, we hope to learn uh, more about how this, this device works in order to make it better, uh, more performing, scale it up uh, um, even more than what we've already done. And so this will benefit Earth applications, hopefully pharmaceutical production. As far as space is concerned, if you think forward uh, in terms of Mars missions or exploration of deep, deep space, you need to have the capability of making uh, molecules. Uh, people are looking at 3D printing as a way to make parts, but you have to be able to make also material, whether it's a drug or another thing. You know, fuels could be an obvious example. And so you need chemical processing capabilities, and this, if it works in the way we hope, would enable certain steps in order to pave the way towards chemical synthesis in space. And of course, there's a very exciting horizon. So there's already a number of researchers that are looking at this, and we think this it's an important contribution in the field. Um, so I, I, I hope this provides an overview of what we're doing, and I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, do we have any ready. questions here in the room? Let's go in the back first. different um, fluids according to their polarity. Are there other methods you see or degrees of freedom where you can influence the, the chemical process that you want in the end to make? So as far as the separation is concerned, uh, you know, we do, we do rely on capillarity. So capilla capillary forces, uh, you know, the capillarity phenomena scale with the, the diameter of the pore you're using. So we could use different membranes with different pore sizes to get different phenomena. But we already have, uh, at least for the time being, we have enough understanding there. 
So that is a parameter you would change to optimize for specific conditions. And as far as phase is concerned, probably would be something interesting to explore in other missions. So what we are doing now is uh, explore one device first and see how it performs, and then we have another one that is modified internally to change the role different forces play. So surface forces are dominated by the landscape, or actually their relevance is dominated by the landscape. So we'll devise with an internal geometry to try to downplay uh, that scenario. And on Earth, it actually doesn't really work that well. We will want to see what happens in space. Hi, um, ChelseaSpace.com. Um, so just to clarify, um, you think that your, um, your fluid separating device when um, you know, improved and studied in microgravity in space could be then used to you know, be a basis for chemical synthesis and further down the line, potentially drug and pharmaceutical creation in space for long crewed missions? Yes, that's exactly okay. what I'm okay. hoping. <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm hoping, yes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> right here, fourth row. So with the actual container being one of the reactants, what or how big is the problem with, I guess, resupplying the reactant when it actually is part of the container? Is that um, one of the pieces of the equation that you figure into the puzzle where, um, I guess, as it's reacting with the container itself, is this something which like wears away with time or is so, it a continu yes. continually, I guess, forever as long as the device is operable? So uh, it's, it's a very good question. So there's uh, two scenarios. One is our experimental condition, and the other one would be if you were to perform uh, real chemistry in space. So uh, as far as we are concerned, we actually have, uh, we are recycling the liquids. So we have a supply of uh, water-like, a supply of oil-like, and we mix them together, as you've seen in, in the clip, and then we see how well the device separates them. And then they go okay. back to the same uh, container they came up with from, and then we'll cycle through different scenarios. As far as chemistry space, you know, if you have a reagent, indeed you will consume the reagent, but on the other side you also get, get your product. So I guess that uh, hinges on a more general question of supplying things uh, in space. Uh, if you were able to make a, a wide variety of chemical transportations, Ideally, you can store on 10 substances and being able to make a thousand, actually. Because if you can play with chemical reactions, the number of molecules you can access is much more than the number of uh, molecules you have as a starting material. So uh, this doesn't necessarily answer your question of how you would store up, but it, op it opens up possibilities in terms of uh, material you can actually access uh, if you can do chemistry space. More questions? Uh, what is the rate of separation and how much volume will you be putting through the experiment? So in, in this case, the total volume that we have is about a liter, uh, divided in two bags of uh, half a liter each. Uh, this device, a small scale device, actually, to see if it's working, uh, takes a very small amount uh, of material. So the internal volume is about half a uh, milliliter. So you just have to wait to, uh, to be at steady state. So. Uh, one to two milliliters of material are enough to collect the data points. So there's a lot of data points that we can collect. Any other questions here in the room? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Our next two speakers are coming from Penn State University. We have Alexandra Radolinska, who's the principal investigator of the microgravity investigation of cement solidification, and also graduate researcher Juliana Neves. It's a great pleasure to be here and present our work, which the title you have described is Cement Solidification in Space. And a lot of times when I'm asked what the research women do, and I just say simply concrete, people give you blank look and say they don't need to use a concrete research. <laughs> and we will need shelters for the human mission 
we would need to protect the equipment from the radiation effects, from the uh, any impact that could, we could experience, and we need to find a way to produce these values and produce a safe environment for humans or instruments to be in there. And it turns out that concrete is going to be our material to go. So our research will actually look into how cement reacts with water and how this very complex process of microstructure formation happens in space. So the process is actually fairly, fairly complex. We take it for granted and we take shortcuts when we talk about concrete, assuming that if you mix cement and water, they will solidify and will create stone-like material. The process has been fascinating scientists for the last 50 years. And for the last 50 years, despite the current technology and instrumentation that we have, we still don't understand this process completely. So we want to simplify the experiment by sending into space just cement and water that will be mixed on board an ISS, and we will watch that complex microstructure formation that will be stopped at a given time intervals, and we want to see what's the microstructure formation. On Earth, the process has been investigated but still has many questions remaining. So if we can make the process pure, because we know from protein research that the crystals will go larger and more, more ideal in its shape, if we can narrow down the amorphous phases and the crystal phases forming concrete, maybe we could, or cement, a hardened cement phase, maybe we can improve the process on there. And when I teach materials classes, I always ask students what's the most widely used material on Earth? And the answer is water. What's the second most widely used material on Earth? And that's concrete. For every person sitting in this room, there is one ton of concrete being produced and consumed every year. And every ton of concrete is responsible for emission of approximately 0.8 ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We really need to understand much better what is happening with this material and how can we make it more sustainable on Earth and how we can make a usage of raw materials present in the space and make a binder, a concrete-like, cement-like binder in the space. So Juliana brought the experimental part, but she will show this to you, the experiment, and Richard and Barry, who are partners of our project, are sitting in the back. So we will combine a small amount of cement and water, we'll burst the pouch, and after a certain amount of time, we'll flush the system with alcohol because the alcohol stops the process of hydration. You guys wanna give it a try? Sure. So I'm gonna do a live demo here. So this is how the uh, pouches are gonna be run. So we have here water, we have cement, and we have the alcohol. So for the real samples, sorry, for the real samples, uh, we have different compositions. So we can look at different um, crystals growing and different types of materials that forms. Uh, we can also take a closer look at um, dissolution and precipitation and also the entire hydration process. So if you can hold the microphone. Here. All right, hope it works. Uh, so you see right now the, the, the burst, <coughs> the pouch was, the burst, the seal was burst here, and the astronauts will have a, a, a rubber spatula to mix it on the, on the table, so it's going to be a little easier to attain any forms of microstructure. What you're observing right now is cement being combined with water and the hydration process starts. And actually it's an exothermic process with a tiny small amount of heat being exhibited. But the chemistry behind it, what we are seeing right now is very, very complex. So we will see the solution of different species and the slow formation. The cement grains uh, first dissolve their outer circumference and then they became stagnant for a little bit of time. And then there's certain um, concentration reached, critical concentration reached for the reaction to, to proceed and we want to stop these reactions and watch them when they occur in an ideal space, which is gravity free. So this is the first stage of the mixing. So um, the sample is gonna sit on the ISS for three hours, seven hours, or 24 hours for the hydration process. So we can kind of track down um, how the microstructure develops over time. And um, after this um, time periods, we are gonna have um, to flush the sample with alcohol so we can uh, arrest hydration. And um, by the time that the samples return to Earth, we can just analyze the microstructure and compare to the Earth microstructural development. So that's the plan. 
this is our demo sample. The, the real samples are properly labeled, and we have a series of ground-based experiments all compared to the space based experiments. And we are hoping for a breakthrough in a technology of cement and concrete, both on terrestrial and extraterrestrial. Anyone have questions in the room? And of course, if you're watching on NASA TV, please use the hashtag AskNASA on social media. <coughs> Any questions here at Wallace? Yep, right here from Rob. Um, can you talk about a little bit of the applications that this might have on uh, in-situ utilization resource uh, optimization on maybe the moon or the moon? Or, sorry, sorry. My name's John. I'm from the Mobile Dot Space. Can you talk about uh, the in-situ resource utilization uh, applications this might have on the moon? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we do. We, we have fairly good understanding by now what's the lunar regolith, and we have some samples of lunar regolith, which Julian is already investigating. Turns out that the, the rocks or the aggregates that we can find at the moon, they're fine, and if their fineness is, is adequate, they can actually be partially reactive. We also participated in a NASA challenge for the Centennial Challenge to create uh, shelters on Mars, and we are able to 3D print a binder that actually did not contain cement, but was purely using a materials present on Mars, and these indigenous species had to be activated by alkaline solutions, but potentially that would be a small component that needs to be taken from the Earth, and we could utilize natural resources, natural rocks, and soils available in extraterrestrial space. Thank you. Patrick Hedrickson, HighCamera.com. I was wondering, will concrete set up in the vacuum of space? That's a very good question. The concrete setup, and, and an even more interesting question is what's going to happen to that moisture that is being <coughs> because there is a lot of loose water that is present that's going to be taken away by vacuum. So when we think about processing of these materials, they would be 3D printed, and they most likely would be, would be 3D printed under these large domes that would be set up for the construction processes. So we do have an opportunity, and Richard is here in the room, we can talk maybe afterwards. Uh, we do have an opportunity potentially to send some ready samples and see how much damage would occur with the rapid radiation and the vacuum present, and we know there will be negative effects, but we will hopefully be close soon to answer, to give you the answer that is at the science space and merit space on that. So my question is, you're dealing with mainly mixing the concrete in space, but how do you plan on forming the concrete? Because on Earth, when we pour concrete, we put up forms, and then you pour the concrete for the structure that you're, you're um, using it for. So what are your plans on overcoming the obstacle of a free-flowing liquid in space when you have to have it set up in a proper configuration? Thanks for the question. Um, so um, this research is just the first step. It's we are much before this, we didn't reach there yet. Uh, but as Dr. Lindstrom was explaining, everything might be 3D printed. So we are developing this technology on Earth and it's gonna probably be uh, applicable to um, space construction. We have another question in the room and then we'll go to social media. Hi, so how are you planning to observe chemical reactions at the ISS? Are you, the astronauts going to be taking pictures? Are they going to be doing chemical analysis on the sample? So, very good question, thank you. Um, so that's the purpose of the alcohol. With an alcohol flush, we are able to arrest hydration, and that's why we are gonna arrest hydration over time. So we have 120 samples that are gonna be arrested. So we have this cement here that is gonna be stopped at three hours. The, the other identical sample is going to be stopped at seven hours and so on and so forth. So by the time the samples return to Earth, we are going to compare the microstructure of the sample that was mixed on Earth to the one that was mixed on in space. In space. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from social media. Twitter user Mac asks, will the experiment be done in pouches while spinning to simulate gravity? We, we have actually another ongoing um, inward progress. We would want to spin the samples because when we talk about the space, the deeper space, we don't have just the one type of gravity or lack of gravity. As we move to different planets, we get different gravitational settings. So we would be actually want to, we would be willing to and, and planning to do some centrifuge experiments as well. 
So this is our first step to understand how hydration will be affected by lack of gravity. That will give us some scientific answer, and then we'll plan our experiments just basically based on the findings of the first step. Thank you for the question. Any other questions here in the room? Okay, thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Cubert is a, a radiometer, which means a sensor that tries to measure the amount of power coming in the electromagnetic spectrum coming from Earth. And in particular for Cubert, it's a uh, microwave radiometer. So the part of the electromagnetic spectrum we're looking at is in the microwave region for us between 6 and 40 gigahertz. Um, the reason for doing that is because uh, Earth produces natural emissions in those frequency ranges. And uh, those emissions, it turns out, can be used for measuring a lot of different properties of the Earth, including properties of the atmosphere, like the water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, things like the temperature of the sea surface, things like ice coverage in the Arctic. There's a lot of different applications for trying to measure the natural noise coming from Earth in those frequency bands. And there's uh, a number of satellites measuring those emissions for those kind of applications. Those satellites have been operating for decades, and they're important parts of uh, monitoring Earth's Earth's uh, weather, or Earth's environment, trying to do Earth science. So they're important sensors uh, for trying to uh, observe our planet. So CubeSat radiometer, the next uh, part is radio frequency interference. So I, there was a slide, I could have that slide back there. Um, this slide shows some examples of those kind of measurements. So from, from uh, radiometer in space, at the moment this is in particular from the uh, Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, it has a radiometer in this band these sorts of frequencies looking at Earth. And you can see some of the natural thermal emissions that are coming from Earth, but you also see these red kind of blotches there. And it turns out those red blotches are not Earth's natural thermal emissions. Those are uh, man-made transmissions. Because it turns out this part of the frequency range between six and 40 gigahertz is not just useful for measuring uh, natural noise coming from Earth. It's also very useful for doing things like wireless communications and radar sensing and a lot of different other applications. And as we all know, the demand for those kind of services just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. So as that happens, there's more and more competition between uh, people who want to use the spectrum for transmitting information and uh, scientists who want to measure Earth's natural thermal emissions to, uh, to measure properties of the Earth. So from Kubert's point of view, the man-made transmissions are interference. 
So that's why it's radio frequency interference. Right? We were measuring radio frequencies. So, um, so this is a problem for uh, for microwave radiometers trying to observe Earth. And you know, as the demand for the spectrum gets higher and higher, it's harder and harder to keep doing these important scientific measurements. So the last part of Qbert's name is technology validation. So Qbert is all about uh, a new kind of processor to attach to a microwave radiometer so that it can uh, still continue to measure the natural thermal emissions even in the presence of someone else or other signals that are coming from Earth that are man-made. And uh, so this, we built a new processor that's a very capable processor. Um, it's, it would be the first time a processor like this has been used in space. And the goal of Cuba really is to demonstrate the success of that processor so that it can be used in uh, future radiometer missions as they continue to uh, be used in the future and you know, really help address this problem of the competition between the science uses of the spectrum and the uh, other uh, uses of the spectrum. So we have a couple pictures here. There's a picture of the Cubert CubeSat uh, in its stowed position. That uh, hash thing at the bottom is the payload antenna, again measured between 6 and 40 gigahertz. There it is turned on its side with the antenna deployed and the solar panels deployed. And uh, there's a picture here of our Cubert team. Cubert's uh, you know, a project that involved a lot of participants. Uh, but, you know, I'm from the Ohio State University, so I'm, I'm a Cubert PI. But we also have uh, team members from NASA JPL, NASA Goddard, Blue Canyon Technologies provided our spacecraft bus. They're, they're, they did a great job with that. Um, and also, we want to—I think all three of our projects here will want to thank the Earth Science Technology Office of uh, NASA that's funded these, these uh, programs. So I'll hand it off next to Professor John Sekar. We're going to talk about him. Thank you. He's done a lot of the setup and uh, also a lot of the thanks. Uh, so that gives me more time to talk about the problem. Like me, many of you drove in last night. I am sure, like me, many of you went through this high water crossing. There were a lot of signs. <laughs> and like me, I think a lot of you tried to outsmart the forecast and outsmart the storms, and we couldn't. And I, I think I can outsmart, it never works. So this is a perpetual problem because we still need to observe these storms with very high temporal and spatial scales. And in spite of all this, was all the paper done from Mark Twain when he said, we still don't know exactly when the cloud forms and when it rains. And we need to observe these storms as a function of time at one space. We know how to do that from a geostationary orbit. But that's all a lot of visible and infrared measurements. And if we have to look at them with microwave where you penetrate deeply, you need uh, microwave measurements and radars and so on. So that's the challenge we are taking on, which is looking Tempest, which is, uh, I have a title there, which says Tempest stands for Temporal Observation of Storms and then Tropical Systems. So temporal is the key thing here to look at a time resolved. So a lot of us have seen, uh, I'm used to work with big radars, and as you have driven outside, uh, you see huge antennas, and actually I have personally worked with uh, one of those radars called Spandor, big radars. But then when you start getting into this small measurement, then they said, you have to make it really small if you want to continuously observe it. One way to continuously observe it is launch a whole bunch of these things so that on that place, they just come take turns and observe. So we all take turns to observe these things. So if you have to take turns to observe these things, we need to make a lot more of these. And a lot more of these means they have to be smaller, cheaper, in small serial blocks. Everything was fine until somebody told us it's serial block size because I'm used to working with radar antennas that are football size field. <laughs> and then they said, you better put it in bag. First time I went, what? <laughs> so a lot of the development in Tempest D technology is, um, like uh, Professor Johnson said, uh, this is uh, radiometric measurements which is you observe the atmosphere and then try to predict precipitation at multiple frequencies using radiometers. As a good segue, the next speaker will speak about radars. So we put multiple of satellites, and the way to, for you to imagine this is uh, we have to do orbit maneuvering, how to position them. A lot of you imagine that, have you seen, anybody has observed uh, people putting these uh, traffic cones with a moving car? There was a person. <laughs> The thing moves, just keep on dropping traffic cones. So, <coughs> just like that, we want to position satellites. 
you can see here a bunch of satellites and uh, they are 6U, which is uh, 10 by 22 by 23. And then they, will, they are making measurements at the frequencies from 89 to 182 gigahertz. So this whole project is about developing all the technology that what we use to move from huge systems into shoebox size. And, uh, and this is where the, the setup is, the satellite, just like the Professor Johnson showed, this is uh, uh, the desktop with the, the solar panels pulled out. And then this is what we think it's going to look like when it flies. With that, I will give it to you. And so uh, I'm working on BrainCube. I'm the principal investigator of BrainCube. BrainCube is like a sister mission to Tempest, very similar science objectives. The main difference is that Tempest B is using radiometers, BrainCube is using a radar. So BrainCube stands for radar in a CubeSat. And it's just that, it's a radar in a 60 CubeSat, and as the name also said, it measures rain. You can see there a picture of the, of the actual instrument that we're going to be flying with the antenna uh, deployed. So uh, uh, we, we, we believe that BrainCube is going to be the first active instrument in a CubeSat. So CubeSats have been around for a long time. So why, what was the challenge about uh, putting a radar in a CubeSat? Uh, radars are notorious for being very large, very power hungry instruments. Uh, so a, a, a group of JPL engineers developed a new architecture for radar, and we were able to reduce the size, mass, and power consumption of the radar by about an order of magnitude, a factor of 10. So you can see here, just to give you perspective, how small a cube is, we're comparing CloudSat Radar, which is a radar uh, very similar to RainCube. It was uh, launched about uh, 12 years ago and compared to RainCube. So on the left, all of those blue boxes on the left fit on the little uh, blue area on the right. Uh, as you may know, uh, CubeSat volume is measured in a unit called U. It's a square of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. So as you can see, the cloud sub radar is about uh, 200 U. The radio radar is only two and a half U. So it's almost a hundred of uh, times uh, smaller than uh, cloud sub. So significant advancement in the technology. And uh, it's true that rain cube doesn't do everything that cloud sub can do. Cloud sub, as the name says, measures clouds. Cloud particles are very, very small. Rainfield cannot do that, uh, we can only measure rain droplets. Uh, so, if we had the technology to measure clouds 10 years ago, why are we investing in rain cube? Uh, same as, as Tempest, the strength is really in the number. Uh, we can only send one instrument such as CloudSat every many years. Whereas with rain cube, we expect that we could send a constellation of these little cube size and then we could measure uh, very frequent temporal and spatial observations of precipitation. So there's two main submission scenarios that we envision for radio. The first one is just that, sending uh, multiple radars in uh, multiple optical planes and uh, just have a very frequent observations of precipitation. The second one actually is something that is what got uh, many scientists extremely uh, motivated about RayCube. Uh, it is launching a chain of satellites so that we can actually observe uh, the structure of uh, the internal structure of the of the clouds uh, as they vary in time. Uh, radiometers usually take a picture of the top of the clouds. Uh, radars actually penetrate the cloud and they give you a profile of the precipitation inside the cloud. They measure the reflectivity of those particles. Uh, this uh, reflectivity is measured in this very strange unit that scientists invite, invented that is called DBC. So you can see that if we had uh, uh, many of these uh, CubeSats, they could follow, the, they could observe this cloud as it is evolving, and they could take these snapshots of the cloud, of the reflectivity of the cloud inside the cloud as it evolves inside. But RainCube is not only about the radar instrument, we're also demonstrating a new antenna development. It's a parabolic antenna, a K-band antenna. It's about half a meter uh, size, and if you can start playing the video, um, uh, it, uh, uh, it fits into a 1.5 U volume. It stones like an umbrella, and 
and it has a, a motorized deployment. It goes very slowly. This is a four times the speed, so it actually takes about three minutes to go up the, the, the canister. This is actually the, 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 the deployment in the actual CubeSat uh, right before we started uh, for launch the semi-smooth anorize. So it goes up as you see, and then at the end you'll see now that the ribs are preloading. So they're gonna open up very quickly. Uh, so now we're gonna go real time and then we go into slow motion. So you can see how the ribs open up and then um, in the, uh, uh, this antenna, so this uh, parabolic reflector, it has a sub-reflector. So first, uh, the uh, ribs, very close to now, we're gonna go into slow motion. You'll see how uh, the ribs will start opening up. And then in the end, the sub-reflector is going to be, uh, it's going to pop back. When the umbrella panel settles, then the sub-reflector is going to be popping up. So this antenna is not only useful for radars, uh, it has many other applications beyond radars. So it can actually use for, it can, it can be used for communications uh, to significantly increase the speed of uh, communications in space. So we want to have an independent validation that the radar, uh, that the antenna uh, deployment was successful. So we, uh, we have a camera in the, in the CubeSat so that we can observe that, we can actually see on the ground that the antenna was deployed. And if you can play that video now, you'll see this is a very different video that doesn't look as good as the previous one, but we will be able to take those captures of the, of the antenna as it deploys, and then we'll see that the ribs have deployed and that the software vectors have deployed. Uh, so in summary, we're very excited about this mission. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, it's right now it's a technology demonstration that is like it's successful. Uh, Soon we'll see constellations of these small radars together with radiometers, uh, which will significantly improve uh, weather and climate forecasting and our understanding of the water cycle. Okay, now we'll take some questions. If you have someone in mind who you want to answer your question, please direct it to them. And if not, we can figure out who's the best person to answer that. Do you have any questions in the room? What you're, are you looking at on-ramps to move this technology out of R&D and into commercial use? You've already got um, a number of small sat companies deploying um, various tools to gather, to generate data commercially. And it sounds like there's both on-ramps in, in terms of the types of satellites and instruments you're building, but also more generally um, moving the uh, antennas um, out into uh, general use for, for CubeSats? Yeah, so at JPL we're actively involved in a, a, a releasing this technology to industry. The antenna, we already have a partner we're working with that is going that has a license to build this antenna. Uh, same thing for the radar. If the radar was successful, we would partner with the uh, commercial vendors uh, to uh, uh, build these constellations of radars. Other questions in the room? Thank you for taking my question. So I think that this is for anybody who wants to answer it. It's not directed to any one of you, but one of the first images that we saw was, I guess, um, like this, the spectral images of human activity on the planet. So does this technology have the possibility to, I guess, forecast our influence in being co-creators of the weather? Because as we know, we have things such as the lake effect which influences the weather drastically, but will it be commonly known like as the city effect in the future, as cities themselves become things which can drastically influence the weather and the atmosphere? Uh, I would say that wasn't our first goal for this project. Um, you know, Qbert, for our particular project, Qbert will be observing Earth emissions between six and 40 gigahertz. Now we observed at a single gigahertz at a time the instrument can tune, it will take us a while, and we have about one year mission life. During that time, we do expect to produce some uh, images of different parts of the spectrum. So we will have some of that kind of information. You know, there are other parts of the spectrum that may be more indicative of the kind of activity you're talking about. For example, these uh, maps of how the Earth is lighted uh, at different periods of time and so on. But uh, it's an interesting idea. Next, we have a question from social media. 
on Twitter, um, user Lee asks, could this CubeSat research lead to earlier warnings for catastrophic storms? Is it, uh, the, will your CubeSat help early detection of significant storms? Oh, so definitely yes. Like I said, um, the, the key aspect of it is uh, temporal variability. So we want to observe all the way from formation of clouds to formation of precipitation. And then it was also shown that finally this will also get into models, which gets further into forecasting. And the reason why we want to get into the satellite scale is because uh, then we can get into these things at the models at a global scale. So the short answer is yes. Any other questions here in the room? Hi, my question is about Hubert. Uh, the Mark rays are my favorite. Can you talk a little bit more about the specific type of antenna that you're using? And you also talked about you're looking at one gigahertz uh, at a time and how you're gonna be doing that. Okay, sure. Um, so one thing about <coughs> Hubert is a little different from the other two projects is um, we're observing at lower frequencies than a, either uh, Tempest or RainQ. And uh, one thing about using lower frequencies is you really need a big antenna to be able to have good uh, resolving power on the Earth. And you may have noticed Qbert doesn't have a big antenna. And that's because Qbert's goal is to demonstrate this processor for separating the thermal emissions from the man-made transmissions, more so than it is trying to you know, have a high resolution image on the Earth. So Qbert has only a small antenna but the small antenna is good enough for us to accomplish what we need to do to demonstrate this processor. Um, and the, the second part of your question was about... Um, How you're looking at just the, you said one gigahertz frequencies right. at a time? Yes, yes, so, um, so in this range of frequencies, again, six to 40 gigahertz or so, there are multiple radiometers currently in orbit observing Earth, and those radiometers typically have a set of, say, five or six frequencies that they use. And each, each one of those that they use is about a gigahertz, around a, a gigahertz wide. So Qbert's goal is to really focus on those bands that the radiometers in orbit use right now. And that's why we set our, our little piece we can look at at one time about the same size as that. But actually we can tune anywhere in that range so that we can also look at other bands that aren't currently used to see if they might be useful for for. <coughs> Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you all very much. So with that, we will end our show. Thank you again to all of our speakers, everyone who's here at Wallops to see a rocket launch and everyone who tuned in on NASA TV and online. Uh, be sure to check out live launch coverage starting Monday at four o'clock a.m. Eastern time. You can also learn more about this launch at nasa.gov slash orbital ATK, and you can follow along with these research experiments and more at nasa.gov slash station. So, what's my reaction after having experienced that? Well, I'm glad that I took the initiative to ask the questions that I did because it didn't seem like many people there were asking questions and maybe it's because they felt like they were supplied with enough information as to where they didn't have any questions or maybe they just didn't know at all what things, you know, were. And if you don't understand to a certain degree, you can't ask a question. You know, and some of my questions, I felt like were just to clarify my own understanding. Um, I didn't necessarily want to go into the experience with the sense of it being just for me, but you know, due to the fact that nobody else was asking any questions, I felt that it was appropriate for me to use a question to clarify my own understanding. And uh, the one question that I felt like didn't necessarily get answered that I wanted to specifically was with the first team and their use of the cold lab 
and the implications of this technology with superconductors and the possibility of being able to better understand these materials in a very and extremely cold environment so that we can possibly transition our understanding to creating devices which operate in normal temperatures. That way they can be something which are utilized much more frequently in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, I know that Elon Musk um, and other peoples which are working on transportation technologies and things to that extent could utilize this technology very frequently, you know, levitating things and other objects, but to adequately levitate an object, you have to operate the superconductor at a very, very low temperature. So it's very detrimental that we work on creating a technology or understanding the technology better to utilize these things in a more hospitable environment so that we can take advantage of them. Now, the other question that as I was asking it, you know, I saw one of the ladies up on stage start shaking her head and all of a sudden it was just like, whoa, I'm, I'm caught in a question where already somebody's, you know, displaying the fact that I don't necessarily understand what's going on here adequately. And like midway through the question, I realized, oh, the device itself actually does not contain a reagent for the reaction. The device is literally just a mixing. It's like, you know, utilizing a beaker or a centrifuge because in space, you can't just pour the liquid into, you know, a beaker and then spin it on a hot plate with a magnetic stir rod. You have to like centrifuge or other things to, I guess, mix all of the reagents. And I guess that the device itself uses capillary action to draw and pull the reagents through the mechanism or the device and then mix them. And then obviously you're gonna clean it with some sort of solvent afterwards or whatever, but you know, for some reason I just kind of misunderstood him initially and he said something to the effect of, you know, actually having reactions occur like while they're being placed through the products. And for some reason in my mind, it just was heard as the actual apparatus itself was a reacting mechanism within the actual apparatus. I mean, to a certain degree, if we look deep down enough into the science of it, capillary action is a reaction of reagents. And so it definitely is something that you take into consideration in the chemical equilibrium process. You know, that's the state at where, where things actually stop reacting and you reach equilibrium. Um, but I'm glad that I didn't shy away from, you know, the embarrassment of asking a question then all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye seeing myself on live NASA TV with all the cameras on me and everyone in the room and the lady up on stage shaking her head you know obviously understanding correctly that I misunderstood what was being spoken but I mean to a certain degree like I said before when you're going off into space you got to calculate obviously all of these things into the equation and the chemical equilibrium and how much space you have and you know obviously taking everything up into space with you so that you can I guess do chemical experiments or actually create products without having to ship the product up into space literally you have your own lab which is designed to operate and function in zero gravity environments which this device itself actually does and immediately after I asked the question I was like gaining this sense of realization you know he's like oh blah 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 he said good question or and I think that he was just kind of doing that like to patronize me a little bit because he saw that I was a little bit maybe misunderstanding what was being spoken and that, you know, all the cameras were on me and stuff like that. So he's like, oh, good question, young lad. You know what I mean? Spot on, boy, to make me feel better about myself. But I think that I understand it now. It's just literally another method of utilizing the technology to mix reagents for a reaction, not necessarily having the reagents react with the apparatus. Like I said, to a certain degree it does. And obviously you're gonna factor all of that 
into the equation when we're talking about you know what types of reactions can actually occur in such a device utilizing capillary action and also you know the space constraints of operating in a very I guess demanding environment economically where every you know amount of microscopic space counts and energy consumption so definitely the whole thing's you know factored into the equation on the large scale here but uh yeah those are just my my thoughts and i'm glad that i kind of you know stuck my neck out a little bit and was actually willing and able to ask some questions maybe the questions that i asked clarified things for other people they certainly clarified things for me so this is a a message out there to everybody who you know is at one point in time wondering as to whether or not they should ask a question ask a question if you look dumb you're probably gonna be smarter after you ask the question and so it's always worth asking anyways that's the the takeaway lesson from that whole experience and I will see you all I guess later Scrambling processes, trying to comprehend the unknown, which formed them, as if they could, could still be, flicking a booger off into space, at an attempt to comprehend space itself. When in reality, they themselves are space. Let me know where it is. Assembling the disassembled parts of the universe to explore what it was formed from, learning almost feels as if it is stealing, having to struggle to find out, but what isn't given? The propellant blasting us off into space, an effort funded by humanity Funded by what gives to us, attracted to the very thing that formed who we are, looking out to figure out what we can only see from within. The uncovered space, now paralleled to be a realm of comprehension inside ourselves. A door previously unopened, that once seen, brings to light the dark places of our mind. What fuels the rocket is much more than what's stored in the propulsion system. It is the multitudes of peoples that are unsatisfied with what they have been given, oxidized by a process of common interest, bringing the planet together to reach unfathomable depths. As we ascend beyond the sky, space being only as cold as the company we keep. Their innocence exceeded only by their exuberance, confiscating wisdom at a cost to their youth, growing old only to lose their desire to use what they had gained.
of you, I, there was one person who jumped off the bus hopping. Who <laughs> <laughs> hopped off the bus? I mean, I, I may have hopped. Yeah. It, it was you. It was you. It was you. Um, that's what we're here for. Is that it's really great to see you guys come out and have a great time and, and enjoy doing what we get to do as a job. Um, sometimes we do forget that it is a rock and it's going to space. Uh, yeah, right. it's still a job for us, but it's days like this and we can see you guys and you can, we can share what we do with you guys and see the, the happy faces when we get to wake up at one o'clock in the morning. And, uh, but we're here, to, we're here to show this to you and share this with you. So thank you for coming. Um, thank, thank you for you having us. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you for being excited about what we do. Um, any other questions? How close do you get when it takes off? Um, well, I'll be right over there with you guys. Okay. Oh. So, over there. Um, so we have a, a, a launch control center on, on the island, which is a couple miles up north. Um, Here at the launch pad. Yeah. Just getting back on the bus to uh, go explore some of the facilities and uh, some other little bits of candy that we get to suck on. So this is actually called the HIF, it's an abbreviation, and it's where they actually assemble the rocket. And one of the engineers in there was kind of going over the whole process. Um, got to meet a really neat individual from Moscow, and his name's Alexander. He is actually a linguist, but you know we can understand. else in the facility but the rockets are Russian the actual you know nozzle that provides the thrust and then the other portion the mid section was uh, Ukrainian and then the other portion that was inside the hangar in there was from Orbital ATK which I think you know has a few locations nationwide characteristics of experiencing this thing that we call life. 